2 and continue where we left off last time. And I don't know if I'm supposed to title the sermon, Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day, Part 3. Because uh, Nick Spaulding did preach on Alexander the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. And that got me going on the book of Job. And we dealt with uh, Job's uh, horrible, terrible, no good, very bad day where he lost his children and he lost everything he owned. He lost his entire, all his livestock. Uh, most of the servants and employees were killed. And he ended up with, uh, even his wife says, curse God and die. He says, woman, are you my wife? He said, we came naked in this world, we're going to leave naked. We had an elder back in Pennsylvania who said, you've never seen a... Uh, U-Haul trailer hop and had a hearse. And when they bury you, they bury you in a suit that doesn't have any pockets in it. Which means uh, they, uh, they uh, you don't bring it all with you. I know Archie Word, one of the preachers, at a barber shop. You know how barbers, men sometimes gossip as bad as women do. And at this barber shop, uh, Word was having a funeral for a very well to do guy. And the Lord. How much money did that man leave behind? You know? You yes, should do. How much money did he leave behind? All of it. <laughs> Didn't bring a nickel with him. <laughs> Job chapter 2 in your scriptures. Remember, Job thought he lost everything, but in chapter 1, at least, Satan didn't touch his body. He touched all his possessions, all his family, all around him. But he did not go forth and touch his body. But now in chapter 2, we have part 2 of Job. On another day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, Job chapter 2, verse 1, and Satan also came with them to present themselves before him. And the Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? And Satan answered the Lord, From roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil, and he still maintains his integrity. Though you incited me against him to ruin him without any reason. Skin for skin, Satan replied. A man will give all that he has for his own life, but stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well, then he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it, and he sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, Are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. He replied, You're talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? And all this Job did not sin in what he said. When Job's three friends, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Naamathite, heard about all this troubles that had come upon him, they set out from their homes and met together by agreement to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they could hardly recognize him. They began to weep aloud, and they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads. Then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights. No one said a word to him, because they saw how great his suffering was. Let us go to God in prayer. Lord, we're grateful for the man Job, his example of a man of patience. We pray, Father, as we make application here, that we, the body of Christ, can learn from his woes, his troubles, and look at ourselves and say we're blessed. We've got it bad, but not as bad as he's got it. Thank you, Father, for your love, your grace. Bless these words. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's a lady that uh, had a very, 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 very bad, terrible, horrible, horrible day. Uh, whatever could go wrong did go wrong. Her name was Alice Grayson, and uh, she was supposed to be baking a cake for a church ladies' group. This was in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, of all places, and she forgot to do it until the last minute. So she remembered that cake that morning of the bake sale, and after rummaging through her cabinet, she found an angel food cake, 
and she got that mix done and she made it as quick as she could and so while she's drying her hair and dressing she had it uh, sitting in the oven cooking. <laughs> anyway, when she pulled out of the oven the whole metal collapsed. Oh no, oh no, what am I going to do? So she looked around, she went to the bathroom, she got a roll of Yes, Colleen, a roll of toilet tissue. Isn't that, <laughs> isn't that recommended? Anything you bake, you stick a roll of toilet tissue right in the middle of the cake, and then you carefully take the butter knife and you just smear that icing all over that cake. But it looked nice. It looked great. But she told her daughter, Honey, what I want you to do, I want you to get down to that bake sale before anybody else gets there and buy that cake. So her daughter did what she said. She couldn't get down to the rubber set, but her daughter did. But her daughter got down there, and her daughter got on the cell phone and says, Mom, I'm too late. Mrs. Snotty Snodgrass bought the cake. <laughs> oh, no. Mrs. Snotty Snodgrass, the greatest church lady critic in the ladies' fellowship group. We're in trouble. And then meanwhile, this gal's fidgeting. So meanwhile, Mrs. Snotty Snodgrass invited all the ladies of the church to come to her special social supper, dinner, or whatever she's having going on. And this lady that baked the cake did not want to go under any circumstances because she did not want to face the music. Well, where did you get that cake with that toilet paper in the middle of it? You know, at the church, you know, whatever, whatever. Who cooked that thing? So anyway, she reluctantly came to the doings. And I mean, everybody was there, and Mrs. Snodgrass was there, you know, snotty as normal. Mrs. You know, I guess when she drank her tea, she always had a little pinky in the air. You got to be proper when you drink your tea, you know, you got to be so proper. This is church session. So, uh, anyway, she announced dessert. <coughs> and Mrs. Snotty Snodgrass says, and I baked it myself. <laughs> And Alice smiled and thought to herself, God is good. God is so good. Couldn't have been a better person too, you know. Just... But then we look at Job, and wow. You know, I could entitle this sermon, what would it take to get you to quit serving God? Yeah. And I've seen people turn their back on God with their child. I.e. child dies. Job lost ten kids. Uh, I've known people leave God because a wife turned against them. I've known people leave God because their house burned to the ground and they had a car wreck. I mean, Job lost everything. Now the devil's turned on his health. Now, I, I don't know how... I remember when I was a kid growing up, we'd get out there and during Hurricane Donna and play in a wash tub mm -hmm. and pull ourselves down the drainage ditch. thing is, we kids thought that drainage ditch was the Mississippi River. We didn't know that everybody's septic tank overflowed that day drainage ditch. <laughs> we just thought it was the Mississippi River as far as we were concerned. And we'd take the rake or the turn broom upside down, we'd pull ourselves down that, that, uh, that river, you know, down the front drainage ditch. Well, we get this impetigo. Anybody know what impetigo is? Yes. I mean, and we would get boils on the back of our neck. I'd get boils on my head. I'd get boils here, there, and everywhere because you're playing in sewer water. We didn't know. We thought that was the Mississippi River. We never drank out of it, but, uh, you know, we'd probably have boils on our belly button if we drank out of that thing. <laughs> but we had boils. And I remember I had a carbuncle boil. It was three boils, and they had to go to the doctor, and he had to put a tube in the back of my neck to lance that thing. We had three boils come to head. Any of you ever, ever, ever have a boil? Okay. Have you ever had two boils? Ever had three boils? Now think with me with Joe. Joe had boils on his elbows, on his knees, on his buttocks, on his head, on his feet, on his belly, on his back. He was covered with boils. And the only relief he could get is take a piece of pottery pop syrup and scrape these sores and sit in ashes and rub ashes on them to try to dry them up. You talk about misery. I remember when I had shingles. Any of you have shingles? How long did you have shingles? 
How many months? How, how many months? You got the shot. Two weeks has gone? Trudy, how long do you have? Probably about two weeks. I had for nine months. For three months, I slept three hours a night. Barely. For three months. Man, now you said, I'll feel your pain. <laughs> Man alive. That's been two years ago. Uh, that was good. That, that, you know that one Bible verse is, and it came to pass? I mean, it felt like, have you ever, how many have ever had sunburn? Oh. Okay. And somebody comes up on your sunburn and goes, yeah. and you go, ah! Okay, shingles is like having slapped sunburn 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. You can't put anything on you. I mean, you have to wear a night shirt. You can't even wear, I've had a night shirt I borrowed from my wife. Boy, I look good in roses. You couldn't get one of these English night shirts. I mean, I couldn't stand an elastic uh, pajamas around my waist. It just was horrible, horrible pain. And so I got these golf pants. So I went down to the monument place to sell, and I was hanging on my golf pants with one hand. I hold them up in the back, saying, Oh, well, yes, Mrs. Jones, you need to buy this headstone for Mr. Jones. We passed away, da, da. And I'm smiling and all that other. And meanwhile, after I ride up the set, I get down, I go back in the back room, and go, Oh! And we did that for months. I mean, it was just terrible. It's like slap sunburn the whole time. And uh, it was just, I feel your pain. But not any time anybody says they have shingles, uh, he says, yeah, I feel your pain. I've, I've known people have them in their eyes, in their practical eyes. People have them in their hair or in their head, on their head. I have them around my waist and whatever. It, 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 I mean, it just burns. It just, it just whatever. But it was not fun. Joe boils. Top of his head down to his toes. Uh, and miserable. <clears throat> of course, the devil's going to make a pact. Now, <clears throat> Job, he cursed God and died. And Job says, no. That's a depiction of, uh, from a wax museum what Job may have looked like. Not a pretty sight. You talk about miserable. But we wonder, what would it take to get you to quit serving God? How bad does the arthritis have to get? How bad does the rheumatism have to get? How bad does the cancer have to get? How bad does the situation we have got to get to keep us from serving God? And this answers the question of the ages. Not only did Job lose his health, he lost the respect of his wife. Job chapter 19, verse 17. Remember, Job lost how many children? All of them. All of them. All, of them. All, of them. All of how many were there? Ten. Ten. Okay, in the book of Job, chapter 19, verse 7, 17. 17? 19, I got me a brand new, brand new thumb index Bible. And these pages are sticking together. This, this Bible is about all about, about brand new. 1917. Is that where I want to be? <coughs> Verse 17 says simply this. My breath is offensive to my wife. I am loathsome to my own brothers. Honey... We lost ten kids. Can we start our family again? <laughs> Get away from me, Mr. Halitosis. <laughs> you stink like... So that's what he said. I'm offensive to my wife. He stunk. Kind of hard to make love with somebody that stinks. Hint to men, you want love? Put on some you know, aftershave. Shave, you know. It might help. <laughs> Morgan, I can't believe you this morning. <laughs> uh, anyway, that was not in the notes. <laughs> Maybe it need to be said anyway. Yeah, but I said it anyway. Yeah, what you said is what preacher says it's got to be true, right? Amen. But I mean, the Bible did say 
his breath was offensive to his wife. And, and he says he entreated her because of the children. The Bible says he entreated her because of the children. He wanted to have more children. And his wife says, you know, go sleep on your side of the bed or in the other room. I don't know if this is an exaggeration, this is what it looked like, but you can almost hear the nagging of his woman. Curse God and die. Go ahead, curse God and die. Go ahead. No, no, no. Where's this God you're supposed to be worshiping? So faithful. Where's God in all this? God's all in this. He's still on his throne. God allowed this to happen, but the devil did this to him. People want to blame God for death. They want to blame God for illness. They want to blame God for anything, but they forget there is a devil in this world. And the devil is the causative factor of of death, uh, bad health, evil. The Bible says he was a liar and a murderer from the beginning. And everybody goes around, they want to want to have God to, to uh, damn everything. Well, why don't they have the devil do the damning? Because he's the one that all the trouble comes from. He's the one that brought about sin in the beginning and the fall of man in the beginning. And he's the one that brings about temptation. And he's the one that brings sickness and, and death and, and all the horrors of this world. And yet people are so ready to, you know, atheists are the first ones to blame God and the, the, the non existent God because evil is in this world. Well, that's why we have a devil. That's why we have a Jesus Christ. That's why we had Jesus die on the cross to destroy the evil in this world. And that's why we have the grace of God. And that's why we have the blood of Christ to wash away the sins of mankind. And that's why we have a resurrected Christ. That's where the power is. Also in Job chapter 19, verse 19, the Bible says, All my intimate friends detest me. Those I love have turned against me. I am nothing but skin and bones. I have escaped only with the skin of my teeth. Job not only lost his health, he not only lost the respect of his wife, now he loses the respect of his friends. At least your friends usually stick with you. Your fishing buddies, drinking buddies, uh, hunt buddies, uh, gambling buddies, uh, Work buddies. There's always buddies out there. And even Job's, Job's best friends, they came to him. And they were silent for seven days and then they popped off. And there's some things you know when the guy's miserable, now's not the time to pop off and all of a sudden sermonize over him and say, Okay, Job, God's punishing you. What sin did you do? For bringing on this catastrophe on your life. And I was sharing with the congregation last last month. Uh, every time I bust my head or bust my shin bone, mom would tell me, "God's punishing you, Dickie. God's punishing you. God's punishing you." And this is the theology I grew up when I was seven years old. That God was always punishing me. So God was a mean, evil God. Punished me every time I barked his shin or cracked my head. There's some stupid sin I did as a little kid. Might be a sass my mom or stole money from, from somebody's piggy bank, you know, to go to the carnival. Which I did. And Dad gives a whooping. <laughs> Took it out of our allowance for the next month. My brother told twice as much as I did. He didn't have allowance for two months. <laughs> so there. The bigger the thief, the bigger the punishment. Anyway. But God was punished. Now, that's bad theology. When bad things happen to good people and they say God is punishing you, that is stinking, stinking bad theology. Amen. That's not what the Bible teaches. God still loves us. God's grace is still there. God still cares. God still answers prayers. Sometimes God says yes. Sometimes God says no. Sometimes God says wait a while. But God still answers prayer. God's grace is still there. In Job 19, verses 15 and 16, he lost respect of somebody else. <laughs> my guests and my maidservants count me a stranger. They look upon me as an alien. Summon my servant, but he does not answer. Though I beg him with my own mouth, my breath is offensive, my wife, and so on. His employees, those that were left alive, no longer considered him as being the boss man. No respect. 
I know my son was, was up, uh, he was working up there at the cabinet company. He had 1,100 employees working with him, under him. And they did such an excellent job, they made an extra $200,000. And he decided to put $100,000 from some tow motors that they needed for the company at the Crest Cabin Company. They made all the cabins for Lowe's and Home Depot. That was just 15% of the business, just for those two little companies. And uh, he gave 100000 in bonuses to all the employees. Everybody got a $100 Walmart gift certificate. All the employees. Now, what would you say to your boss man if they gave you a $100 Walmart gift certificate? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Not his employees. Walmart? How cheap can you get? A hundred dollars? How cheap could you get? He says, Dad, it's lonely up here at the top. Mm -hmm. And this is the way Moses' servants were. There's the boss man. He's worse shape than we are. They look down their nose at him. Then James was told by the big boss, he says, I want you to lay off 100 employees. Mm -hmm. And the reason... Uh, and, and, and he says, I don't want to let them off. I'd rather just not hire anybody. Better for the morale. Right, Sharon? Publix? Better just don't hire anybody. Freeze them hiring. Works a whole lot better, doesn't it? Better for the morale. Nope. Off of their heads. A couple months later, fire another hundred. A few weeks later, fire ten of your supervisors. Now the big boss came in. This is a big company. Since we're on international, I don't want to get into trouble. Uh, but uh, the big boss asked him to fake and forge the numbers that are going to be reported to the stock agency because if these numbers hit the stock agency, the stock is going to go tumble, tumble, tumble down. And tumble about 15, 20 points. James says, this is the day of Bernie Madoff. He says, when you fake your as an auditor, as chief finance officer of this company, when you fake your, your finances. In the old days, they'd fire you. They don't fire you anymore. You go to jail. Because billions of dollars are affected in these stock figures. He told the big boss, he says, if you want to sign off on these figures, you may, but I'm not signing off on these figures. Okay, James, I understand. I understand. That's okay. That's okay. Remember, he had to fire 100 people, and he had to fire 100 people, and he had to fire 10 of his supervisors. Then uh, James got the pink said, we don't need you anymore. So now he's chief finance officer for Lennox Air Conditioning in Atlanta, Georgia. Doing well. People still buy air conditioning. Commercial air conditioning, especially. But Job was told, you know, as far as his servants, and he had, he had their disrespect too. And then he lost the respect of a child. You hold a child in your arms and you get a big old slurpy kiss so you get a zerber down your cheeks and boy, that's good. But even Job lost respect to children. You know, that's probably the bottom of the run. You know, people hug. Uh, you know, old uh, Smith, big Smitty over there, the big tall guy over to Legacy Church runs the upward football. That kid's a kid magnet. Those kids run to him. They go, we went to some of the Christmas parties they had, and birthday parties they had. And I mean, he's around with 10, 12, 15, 20 kids. They just kid magnet, you know. Joe went to kid magnet. They wouldn't have a thing to do with them. Well, let me tell you the good news. You think he had a horrible, terrible, ugly day? It was more than a day. I don't know how many days and weeks and months went past. If we stopped right here, we'd say God's not fair. If we stopped right here, we'd say, you know, what good is it to serve God? Yeah, here's the epilogue. In Job uh, chapter 42, Job was asked to pray for his three friends and act as their priest because they were sinning against Job by bringing these accusations against him. So Job became 
you can't get forgiven unless I ask God to forgive you three guys, number one. Number two, the Bible says he received 22,000 head of cattle. He had 11,000. So he ended up with double what he had that he lost. Job's wife, ten more children. Ouch. Ouch. <laughs> so, you know, Mrs. Job, curse God and die. <clears throat> Mrs. Job, ten more children, ten more birth pains, ten more, ten more, oh, daughters of Eve. You know, they said, the wife said that if, if the men had to have the babies, they don't have one. <laughs> they don't have one. If the men had to have the babies, they don't have one. They said it's worse than passing a passing a, a, a kidney stone. I've never passed a kidney stone. I've never had a baby. The only thing is, is whenever the doctors bring the bills to us men, Chris, then we have the passing the kidney stone. <laughs> when they hand us the doctor bill and the hospital bill. Job's daughters, Keziah, each of the, the names of the daughters meant something beautiful, sweet as spice. His daughters were beauty queens. They would not only win Miss Polk County, they would not only win Miss Florida, they would not only win Miss America, they would win Miss World. I mean, they had the most beautiful, beautiful daughters. And then on top of that, on top of having beauty queens, Job lived 140 more years. He saw four generations. Now Sylvia's got grandkids and great-grandkids. Can you imagine Sylvia's a great-grandmother? Great-grandma. I can't believe that. She's only 39 and old. She's a great-grandma. That's right, 39 and old. But you can imagine Job, four generations, 140 years later. And you know what... The thing we don't understand is about Job. The Bible never does tell us why he suffered. He doesn't have an epilogue. Said, so, "Well, uh, Job suffered because God and, and Satan were having a chess match, and and God says, okay, you know, go ahead, Satan, go ahead, bring your best, make my day.' It doesn't go into any detail of why the man suffered. And all the New Testament says is, remember the patience of Job." You know, the, the New Testament does something. Remember the patience of Job. Period. And if you never read the Old Testament, you wouldn't know the whole story of Job. 42 chapters or whatever later. Of everything. And I knew, you know, that Job suffered, lost his family, and lost his health. I know he lost all the other things he lost. But the question is still here for you and me this morning. What would it take to get you to quit serving God? Brother Glenn.